Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Ayodele. I'm an energy law and policy enthusiast. Some say I'm a specialist. I'm also a member of the board of ReEnergy Africa. And we welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today, the theme of today's tech webinar is gender and renewable energy, making sustainable energy more inclusive and diverse in Africa. Well, um, the panel is more inclusive than the term inclusive itself. And um, you'd find out that we've got very interesting people making up the panel. Now, according to research, renewable en energy employs about 32% of its um, work staff um, force being women, unlike what we have in, in the energy sector generally, which is 10% lower. So building on that background, there are opportunities to be more, to have more inclusiveness and to be more diverse in 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 um, in the business opportunities in the employment space um, around renewable energy in Africa, um, and because we've got an interesting um, group of people and a very a more interesting moderator, I think I'll just hand over to Jamila. We would be moderating today's session. Jamila, please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayodele. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here today for today's webinar. Do you feel the energy, everyone? Because we have been waiting for you. ReEnergy Africa, in collaboration with Credit Registry and Lex360 Advisory, welcomes you to this third annual webinar, which is titled and themed Gender and Renewable Energy, Making Sustainable Energy More Inclusive and Diverse in Africa. I am Jamila Sharifa Yedin, the MD and CEO of Credit Registry, and I am happy and delighted to be your moderator today. Ms. Angelina Galateva, please, the um, mic is now over to you. Share your slides. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here and for being able to participate in this conference. I'm always excited to talk about women in energy. I've been in energy my whole life. I grew up in Africa, so I'm intimately familiar with the energy situation in Africa. I'm originally from Eastern Europe and I was always interested in equity and energy and decided to come to the United States and study about how we can democratize the energy sector and have more public involvement in the energy sector. Of course, that quickly transitioned me to renewable energy. And I spent my career working at utilities and with grid operators and have seen in real time and in real life how um, gender equality has um, actually transitioned. And it hasn't transitioned as fast as I would like to see it, but there are plenty of opportunities for women and girls to get involved. And I think that we will make the difference. Um, there's no planet B. Uh, part of our participation in the energy sector is to ensure that we save this planet, and that is a mandate. That is my little girl. When she was nine, she's been a climate warrior since then, and now she is uh, studying hydrogen in high school and wants to become a fuel cell developer and change the world by ensuring that we can have 100% renewable energy in all sectors. So we need to start focusing our girls when they're young. We need to encourage them and um, make them proud and happy and confident that they can achieve anything. And of course, energy is at the center of everything that we see. We see the two imperatives right now that we're dealing with on a global scale are the long-term climate and the near-term pandemic. And getting out of both is going to take a push for renewable energy in a major scale because that will allow for economic development. And it will also allow for us to transition um, away from the pandemic. Energy, of course, is the largest and most intensive sector, both in terms of capital and in terms of emissions. And we have seen that climate change is real. It has become an issue that the world is intimately familiar with. We're dealing with it almost on a daily basis, whether it's floods, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's fires, how they impact the existing energy infrastructure and how that energy infrastructure needs to change. I am on the board of the California Independent System Operator, which is one of the largest grid operators in the world. We actually now operate in the larger part of the greater Western United States and every day in real life see the impact of the fires and what the fires can do and how it is with renewable energy 
energy and transitioning to a more diverse system, that we are going to overcome that. So our systems of energy and transforming matter are transforming the planet. The most greenhouse gas intensive sectors are of course electricity, transport and agriculture. And those are the ones that we need to collectively address. I wanted to give more of a global perspective on where energy is moving as a whole and how women are underrepresented and missing on a huge opportunity that we need to capture and we need to be very mindful and thoughtful about how we do it. That's why I was so grateful for the presentation that Irene made because it is very true that we need to be mentoring women and focusing on women and empowering women and breaking down social norms and barriers years that have burdened us for the last few decades. So more than four trillion has been invested in clean energy since 2004, most of it in renewable energy. More solar generation capacity was installed in the past decade than any other technology worldwide. That is due to the fact that green energy also brings in other green benefits apart from sustainability, but also in terms of making money, which is a good thing. The price of solar over the last decade has fallen by 90% and more. The price of wind energy has fallen down by more than 49% in the past decade. The price of lithium ion battery costs fell more than 87% in the last decade. And as we know, storage is a major enabler for renewable energy, whether you're a centralized grid like here in the United States or a grid of the future that's going to be much more diversified as what would be happening, we hope, by leapfrogging technology, as Dr. Coca mentioned, um, in the African continent, because that is a huge opportunity. Wind and solar generation costs have converged and compete, or in many cases, outcompete fossil fuel generation. And hands down, if you're building new generation from the ground up, you should be going renewables and not making the mistakes of the past that we have made where you're with stranded fossil assets that are going to be obsolete in the next decade. Wind and solar power are the lowest cost new source of power for two thirds of the global population at this stage of the game. Renewable energy, because I am the founder of the Renewables 100 Policy Institute dedicated to the transition of 100% renewable energy in all sectors, including energy, transportation, buildings, and fuels. Um, and when we started in 2007, we weren't on the cutting edge. We were on the bleeding edge. And people were yelling at us and saying, even Greenpeace, you know, you should be going for 50% renewable energy because that makes you sound more credible. 100% renewable energy is just unrealistic. Well, guess what? We have been able to reach 100% renewable energy in many sectors and in many countries. And I'm proud to say that the California ISO, which I lead, was able to reach 94.4% renewable energy operation, which is really pretty dramatic. 87% of that was just wind and solar and hydro. Um, so I'm very, very bullish on renewable energy and being able to operate a massive grid with high penetrations of renewable energy. Storage and flexibility are going to be key, but guess what? Those are technical challenges and they are tremendous opportunities for new technology development and innovation. And women should be a part of that transition and that paradigm shift. Automakers, the transportation sector, which is the other sector of major greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, in California, it is 43% responsible for all greenhouse gas emissions in our state. And we have made a mandate, which is a comprehensive mandate to, trans mandate to transition away from fossil powered and internal combustion engines to all electric fuel cell vehicles by 2035. So no internal combustion engines will be available for sale in the state of California. And California, if taken by itself outside of the United States, is the fifth largest economy in the world. So that's a massive market that can lead to changes. Um, and automakers are seeing the message. Uh, they are making huge investments in the electrification of the transportation sector, which again is an opportunity for energy. Energy is the foundational part of our economies, of our future fuels, of our future industries. And if we can be carbon free in the energy sector, we can much more quickly decarbonize all the other sectors. And of course, hydrogen is going to play a huge role in that. We need to be focused though on green hydrogen so that we don't allow the hydrogen industry to become an excuse for the nuclear industry to declare that they have an opportunity for a renaissance. 
Nuclear has no position whatsoever in the future of the carbon free energy paradigm. And I could not be more clear than that. It is very, very expensive and the most unsafe and unreliable source of power that has caused us more consternation than I can possibly say. The last nuclear power station in California is scheduled to be closed down in 2024 and will be nuclear free um, then. Um, and um, the previous one was closed for safety issues because we had a radiation leak and our biggest problem for operating a reliable grid was the loss of 2000 megawatt centralized baseload power that just disappeared because we couldn't bring it back online for safety reasons. So hydrogen made with renewable energy, and we have plenty of that, is going to be the future. The oil majors are also seeing um, that there uh, is a transition of thought and there's a paradigm change. And they're all focusing on pursuing diverse approaches to clean energy, whether it's solar, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's transportation, whether it's carbon capture, digitization, everything is focused on transitioning to being carbon free and to making sure that we can operate on 100% renewable energy resources. Uh, this is a study issued by the National Renewable Energy Lab that basically was a very promising study that said that the United States as a whole can transition to 100% renewable energy. Uh, what we would also require is a backbone grid that can incorporate all the various seasonal energies throughout the country, but it's doable. So focusing on grid modernization, on storage, transmission, behavioral education, resources, and greater cooperation actually enables that to happen. And it's probably the lowest cost and the highest value for us as a society if we want to factor in saving the globe as part of the equation as we transition and ensure that our economies can be robust and developed and inclusive and women should be a part of that as well. Looking at renewable energy jobs um, and how they are transitioned throughout the world, certainly if we look at Africa, there are tremendous opportunities for development and of course the continent um, needs to focus on the electrification um, because I believe about 35% of the continent is electrified at this point in time. So we've got a tremendous opportunity to ensure that this can be done in the best possible way from the ground up with a, a very diverse and, and a very digitized approach as a whole. Again, in terms of jobs and in terms of job numbers, it's renewable energy that provides the most jobs and the most opportunities for economic development. At the top, of course, the leader is solar photovoltaic, and that is going to be the workhorse of any transition. And luckily, most of the African countries are in the Sun Belt, so they can benefit from that as well. We've got hydropower, wind energy, biofuels, and others as well coming in to close second. And then, of course, the storage component and the transportation component in symbiosis with renewable energy development opens even more doors for jobs. Now, one minute women, to wrap up. Yeah. How many? One minute, one minute to wrap oh, up. Oh, okay. Women's share, um, of course, in jobs has, we've always been underrepresented. And I am uh, always upset when I see that most of the women in high positions are either HR or legal or marketing or administrative. Uh, we need to focus more on being technical and being leaders in the field and renewable energy can account for that. There are a lot of job opportunities. If we just take the direct jobs that are in terms of energy generation, that's without efficiency in electric vehicles, we see that by 2050, 84% of the jobs will be in the renewable energy sector. Let's ensure that women are represented in that and that women can participate fully, at least at a 50% level. When you give girls a chance, you save the world. Um, and the future energy system is going to be decarbonized, decentralized, diversified, digitized, and very highly democratized. We need to work together in a mindful and systematic way to ensure that girls and women participate fully in this energy system and that we enable this economic global transition to occur in such a way that we don't have to look for a planet B. Thank you very much. Angelina, wow, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much. Give girls a chance and save the world. Uh, this beautiful um, uh, way to put that. And so we will go into our last speaker right now to Joanna. And thank you, Angelina, once again. Sure.